Welcome to the Buford Church of God. We are so excited that you are joining with us today. This audience that is viewing us through the television is part of our family. We take this as an honor and a privilege to serve you today. And we're asking God that the same anointing we feel in the sanctuary will be communicated through your television right there into your home. We believe that where two or three are gathered together, either in person or through this means of communication, that we are gathered together in His name and He is there among us. And we're asking God to meet those needs in your life today. And we're going to pray a special prayer for you today. We're gonna to ask God to bless you, and guard you, and allow this service to minister to you. In Jesus' name. God, I ask you to touch every viewer today. Be with them. Go meet them right there where they are. I pray you to restore them, heal them, bring them to the knowledge of you, God, and bless them and let your glory be revealed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the service. Let's read 2 Kings chapter 4. It says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all of your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and then pour it into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons brought, who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that he said to her, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Say amen at the reading of God's word. You may be seated. I want to talk to you this morning about this widow woman. She was the wife of one of the sons of the prophets. So she knew power. She had that oil in her, in her life. But she was at a place of destitute. She was poor. She was so poor, it made me think of the, the old sentiment, I got to have $1,000 just to be broke. Have you ever heard that old sentiment? Have you ever been there? <laughs> maybe not even financially, but maybe spiritually. Maybe you've been so broke and destitute that you didn't even know what was going to happen in the next day, and you needed a miracle just to get your life back on track. This is kind of where this lady was. She was so broke that her children were about to be taken. They were going to be slaved and sold into slavery. Because back then, when you were in debt, you had to pay the debt. You didn't get welfare. You didn't get a bonus check. You didn't get that extra stuff that we get today. You had to pay your debt. And that, if that meant selling all you had, if that meant selling your children, that's what happened. And she didn't want to sell her children into slavery. So she cried out for help. And that's the first thing you've got to do when you're destitute. You've got to cry out for help. You, you, I told him in the first service, I said, you know, you're walking around with this broke arm, and you're like, I don't have a broke arm. I'm just fine. Arm's dangling there. I can't do nothing. I'm fine. I don't need to go to the doctor. I don't need to do nothing. But I got to pick up this paper, but I got to hold this microphone. How am I going to do that? Your brokenness is evident in your life, whether you try to hide it, whether you try to paint it pretty. It's there. You're broken, and you need to cry out for help. And too often, you stay in that place of destitute, and you don't cry out. You don't say, hey, I'm the one in need. I need this from God. I, we're teaching this series on arise, Linus arising on Monday nights. And so I'm all into lions right now. I'm just, like, obsessed. <laughs> I love watching them. And I watched this video the other day, and this lion, he had gotten caught behind this embankment. And I don't know if he was wounded or what because the camera angle is, is showing him over the, the embankment. But there's hyenas. 
all around him. And there's hyenas behind him. This lion was alone. Hyenas will never attack the pride because they have no ability to fight a pride of lions. But one lion by himself, and especially if he's wounded, those hyenas will come in and destroy that lion's life. So the, the hyenas are just cackling, made me think of the devil, just cackling, whining, barking, nipping at that lion, and that lion's trying to fight him, but they're all surrounding him, closing in. And the whole time that lion was crying out, roaring, groaning, making loud noises. And what you didn't realize is he was calling his pride. He was letting them know Something's wrong. Come help me. And all of a sudden, two lions come off the side of the screen. And those hyenas, you thought a bomb went off. I mean, they go scattering. Those lions are chasing them, biting after them. Those hyenas are gone in a split second because that lion cried out for help. That's where we've got to be, church. We've got to say, hey, Elisha, your servant's dead, and I'm in debt, and my babies are about to get taken, so I need some help here. I've got to have some help. And when you cry out, you got to cry out to the right people. See, some of you, you cry out. You talk about all your troubles. You take it to social media. You share your drama with all your neighborhood, all your girlfriends, maybe your work buddies. But you don't go to the right people. Those people are in the same mud hole you are. They can't pull you out. You've got to go to those who are leaders in your life, who might say, hey, you know what? You didn't button that shirt up right. Got to fix it. You didn't say that right. You got to fix that. No, don't live your life that way. Let me show you a better way. You've got to have those leaders who come up beside you and help you and direct you and lead you to a better place. Ephesians 4, I love this scripture because it says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God. Did you hear that? He gave some pastors, some preacher, prophets, some evangelists. That means you don't get it all. You can't be all things to yourself. You've got to have those people in your life that edify you, that help you be a better, a better Christian, that help you get out of that debt. There are people all around you, and we have great leaders in this church. We've got great pastors who can help you. We've got great elders who can pray for you and help you through. We've got a great transformation center that's got incredible counselors who can help you through those really tough, difficult places in life. We've got resources that are on a shelf just waiting for you to take them down and to get that help. Now, let me tell you, though. When you go to those leaders and you go to those people that are going to help you, you know what's going to happen? They're going to give you some instruction. And that instruction might be tough. That instruction might sound crazy. I mean, he, this Elisha, he didn't tell her, you know, go borrow some oil from some people. Go get some of those vessels filled and pull them into your house. He told her she's already in debt. And he told her to go get empty vessels. And all she had in her house was that little jar of oil. How, what's that going to do? It didn't make sense. It didn't sound like it would work. But she trusted. She followed the instruction. And I can testify this in my own life. This has happened to me. About three years ago, we were having dinner with Dr. Rutland and you know, he was new to our church at that time. He had just started coming on Wednesday nights, and I was nervous. I was like, oh, don't let me say something. It just sounds stupid. <laughs> he was just like a hero in our family. And he's sitting there, and he's talking to us, and he looks at me, and he says, Mia, let me talk to you about this offering. I had shared an offering a couple weeks before when he was with us, and it was about Cain and Abel. And he said, I, want, I think you should take that, that offering and expound on it. Write. You've got a gift here. You need to write more. You need to write this out, and you need to get it published. Okay, let me tell you, that sounded outlandish to me. That didn't make sense. I mean, I love to write as part of a dream that I have, but I was like, what? I take an offering? An offering devotion? I mean, really? Is that, that didn't sound like a book publishing piece, 
But I took what he said, and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. Because God was speaking into me, and little did I know that was the beginning or part of my journey to be called to preach. And because I heard his instruction and I followed his instruction, God began to do more in my life than I could have done just on my own. Amen. Because God's going to give you instruction, and he's going to pull you out of your comfort zone. He's going to pull you out of where you want to be. Do you think it was comfortable for that woman? to have to go to her neighbors and get those vessels. I mean, come on. She was already in debt. Those widows probably in that community knew, knew her, her plight, and yet she had to go and tell the story. Well, what do you need this vessel for? Okay, let me tell you. I, this is what I have to do. And she probably had to tell that story 250 times just to three houses because they had family visiting because <laughs> she had to ask them for those vessels, and her voice had to ask. And it didn't seem to make sense. But when God gives you an instruction, it might not make sense. But it's for the benefit because he wants to work in you something to bring forth the miracle that's ha- going to happen in your life. So just follow him. Just obey those instructions. And I think that's where one place where we miss it. Because we don't get desperate enough to say, you know what, God? I'll do anything. I'll just do anything. I mean, if you tell me to get up here and preach to a congregation when I'm an introvert and I'd rather be in the shadows and I'd rather not, t- I'd rather do everything in behind the scenes, but you really want me to do that? Okay, I'll do that. Or you really want me to talk to my neighbors when I'm out walking because just to be friendly and maybe invite them to church? You want me to do that? Really? I mean, that sounds a little crazy. He may give you instruction that sounds crazy, that may seem beyond your ability. But if you'll just follow him, he's got a miracle waiting for you. He's going to start pouring that oil in your life. Amen. Amen. And when you decide to obey, I have found you've got to obey like this woman did with gratitude and with precision and with eagerness. And you say, well, I don't see that in that scripture. I mean, how, how does she respond with gratitude. But it's interesting to me that when a needy person is in need, if they're demanding, give me that. I got to have that. Give me that vessel because after all, I deserve it. I don't think she would have gotten a lot of vessels. But if she was saying, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll get this back to you. They said, oh, well, here's another one. Let me give you, let me give you some more because you're just in need. Whatever you need, I'll help you out. And she followed with precision because she didn't gather just the little teapots in her house. She didn't just gather what was in her home. She went to all her neighbors, which is what Elisha told her to do. Don't gather just a few. Gather a whole bunch of them because you're going to need a bunch. And she seemed to do it with eagerness because it doesn't say that this story took a lot of time didn't take weeks, didn't take months. She just had to, you know, figure out what God had to say. No, she was eager to do it because it says that she left him and went in and closed the door behind her and started pouring the oil. She went and did it immediately. And I think sometimes that's another place where we miss it, where we go, well, I mean, I know God said it. I know he told me to go on the mission field, but Maybe, maybe he didn't mean that for right now. Maybe he didn't mean that for this season in my life. Or maybe, you know, I know he told me to teach a Sunday school class, but, you know, I'm a little older. They need to hear from the younger people. Maybe it's for them. Or maybe you're in high school and God said, I want you to speak life for this person. I want you to share the gospel. Well, he didn't really mean that for me. I mean, that's for somebody else to share because that's out of my comfort zone. That's not, really, that's not really my thing to share with somebody. But when God says it, I have found that when I reply, when I follow his instruction with eagerness and with gratitude, I learn a lot quicker. And he's able to give me more instruction more easily. And when I follow those instructions with precision, I have found that I walk stronger in his anointing than I did before. And that's what he wants to do in your life. He wants you to follow those instructions quicker and more easily so that he can give you more 
so that he can bring forth the fulfillment that he's got for your life. He doesn't want you to be lacking. And I think that's sometimes where we've gotten is we're just okay with our lack. We're just okay with our comfort zone. We're just okay doing what we've always done, being who we've always been, saying what we've always said. And you'll get to heaven that way if you love God. There's not condition there. But you won't fulfill his, you won't live in his fullness. He won't, you won't live in all that he has for you. He wants more than you just to ride the pew and make it into heaven and survive life and just get more and more tense. And I'm just surviving. I'm being a good Christian. I'm doing what I've got to do. And I'm just living life. He doesn't want that for you. He wants you to fill those vessels full to overflowing to where it's not just for you, it's for so many people around you that you're able to pour out that oil and he just pours it back in over and over and over again. Amen. He wants more for you, but it takes our obedience. And then you'll find that as you obey him, you've got to pour that oil yourself. Did you notice that in the story? Her sons didn't pour the oil. Her neighbors didn't come by and pour that oil. And I could just imagine, she's probably got, I could just imagine this whole stage being my house. And she's got those five-gallon vats to be filled up. And she's got this little bitty jar. And she goes, okay, hope this is going to work. Not sure. Is it even putting a drop in there? How much is getting in there? And then all of a sudden, it fills up the whole jar. Can you see her? I think I'd be shouting just a little bit. (gasps) It worked. Okay, God did it. I mean, he really, what he said, it's working. Okay, let's try it again. (laughs) Let's do it one more time. And she starts pouring that oil. Because God wants to do something with your faith. He wants you to put the work in so that you will step out of that boat, of that comfort zone, of those easy moments, and he can use you in a greater way as you follow him, as you step out in that boldness, and you pour that oil into those vats. You've got to pour the oil. And I love what Romans 12, it says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of self more highly than he ought, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. By your faith, your miracle will be seen. By your faith of pouring that oil, God's going to fill it up. But sometimes you've got to step out in that faith when it doesn't look like it's going to work, but God said it. And if God said it, you can believe it. He's going to bring it to pass. All you've got to do is believe. And I'm so thankful that he's able to give us those kind of instructions and help us to follow him. But here's the thing. Here's the tricky part of that story is that she filled up all those vessels. They were all filled. They're ready. She's still in debt. She's still got the creditor coming for her babies. What's the next step? This is the crucial part where I think a lot of us miss living in the fullness of God. Because we get saved, we get excited, God's using us, everything's great, I'm feeling spiritual, I'm even in ministry, and God is moving. But yet there's a part of your life that God wants to alter just a little. He wants to confront you. He wants to change. He wants to get you to do some things differently. But yet you never go back to those who discipled you. You never go back to those leaders in your life and go, what am I missing? What more do I need? What more do I need to hear? Do I need to change? Do I need to just fix to make me better at what God's called me to do? Because, yes, God pours out his anointing on us. We walk in that fullness. But every one of us, I don't care if you're five years old or 95 years old, you still need those leaders in your life that can lead you and direct you and confront you. Because if you are like me, and maybe you're not, maybe your thinking is all perfect and you never have an issue and you never have struggles. But there's moments when I need an elder, elder in my life that says, God's done this before in your life. He's going to do it again. Just trust him. Don't doubt him. Don't hesitate. Just walk forward. We've got to have those people in our lives that challenge us, that cheer us, that help us. I had a a person say to me this morning, we're staying through the second service because we want to hear what you have to say, even though we heard it the first time. And I thought, that meant so much to me 
because he was cheering me on. And he knows, this, it was Pastor Jerry, he knows how hard it is. It's hard for him. It's been hard for me to, to step out in this place. You need those people in your life who can help you get to where God called you to be. So don't miss that step. Finish the drill. Don't run those four or three laps as an athlete, and then you quit on the last one. You don't win the race. You, you'll still, in the kingdom, you can still get to heaven per se, but you don't live in his fullness. And I want you to find that fullness. Just like I was sharing where Dr. Rutland challenged me to write that piece, I had to go back to him after I wrote it. One, because I didn't know what I was doing, and I was like... Okay, can you just help me? Can you just critique? And he was so gracious. He's amazing. He said, look, I don't crit I'm not going to critique you, but I'll give you some maybe some interesting tips that will help you be the best you can be. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's a great way to say you're critiquing me. <laughs> but he helped me to know how to do it. And then he helped me again to know even who to send it to, who the publishers were. And then when I did that, it's published in our Church of God Evangel. It got published as one of the articles, and I was like, how cool, that's great. But it never would have happened had I not been willing to take that last step, to go back and say, I need help. I don't know how to do this. And with that woman, she would have never been out of debt had she just had her vessels full and filled up her house. And she never went back to Elisha and said, how do I fix this? How do I get out of debt? Even last night, I was getting ready for today, and Pastor and I were talking about this service, uh, this sermon, and he gave me pointers. He gave me some things. He said, alter that, change that, read verse. It had been so much easier for me at 10 o'clock at night to just not talk to him about it, just, you know what, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do and get it over with. <laughs> But I have that coach, per se, even though he's my husband and he's my pastor. But I've got that coach in my life who helps me do it better, helps me say it a little better, helps me change it to make it more understandable. We've all got to have those people in our lives who help us to do it better. Don't stop before you get to the finish line. And I love 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It says, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it, listen to this, may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. If you're going to succeed, you've got to finish the drill. You've got to stay submissive to the leadership that God's placed in your life. This completion, it's not for just for you. It's for your kids. It's for freedom for your whole family. It's not just for one person. Can you see her taking those vessels back after they're all, she sold all that oil? And she's given them back to those neighbors in her community, all those people that she borrowed from. What happens? She gets to testify again and again and again of the great thing that God did in her life. That's what God wants to do for you. As you finish the drill, you don't just get to see the miracle for you. But you get to testify of it again and again. And you watch that oil being poured out over and over in people's lives all around you. And I've watched this in my own personal life. I've watched in the Grizzle family how Pastor Mike has poured out the oil over and over again. And you've heard his story where many years ago when he got saved, he just wanted fire insurance. He just didn't want to go to hell. And I love that. Sometimes God just saves you to get you. He causes you to fear just enough so you won't go to hell and you choose him. But then he started listening. And he started following instruction. And he started learning how to pour that oil. And his family got saved. And his kids got saved. And then he called, God called him to preach. And then God called his sons to preach. And called Kathy into full-time counseling. Gave her a gift, and she's walking fully in it. God ministered to that whole family because of the obedience and the submission of that one man. And then I married his son. And then somewhere along the way, God said, you know what? You're going to preach too. <laughs> and he pulled me up here to preach. 
And I've watched how God has poured the oil into that man's life, and he's poured it out into person after person after person. And I looked at that story, and I thought, you know, I don't think I'm that widow, but I'm that vessel where Pastor Mike pours the oil in. God pours the oil over and over again. And I don't know where you are in this story today, but I want to encourage you here at the end. We're going to open the altars, and I want you to come pray. And I want you to, maybe you're at the beginning of this story, and you're in debt today, and you don't know how you're going to get out of it. And you're in a mess. God can help you. And you might be in the middle of that story, and you've gathered all the vessels And you've listened to the instruction, and you've done what you're supposed to do, but you're still kind of in that place. You don't know what to do. And it's time to go back to that instructor and learn and get regrouped, if you will, to do what God's called you to be. I don't know where you're at, but I know that God wants you to walk in his fullness. He wants you to be in that place where you're able to start pouring out the oil, and God pours it right back into you. Amen. Thank you.